okay, ladies first. As an actress, Elpidia Carrillo combines mastery of craft and intuition, physicality and introspection, strength and vulnerability. In short, everything that film acting is supposed to be. Maximum impact with minimum expenditure. Elpidia gives her characters remarkable human dimension, complexity, and most importantly, the capacity to move us profoundly. Elpidia's career in Hollywood now spans 25 years, including the unforgettable role she played in The Border alongside Jack Nicholson, and the powerful film in which you just saw her tonight, Salvador. Not to mention Ken Loach's Bread and Roses, apropos of which critic Roger Ebert wrote, quote, The best scene in Bread and Roses is a searing speech by Rosa, delivered by Elpidia Carrillo with such force and shaming truth that it could not be denied the Oscar if only Academy voters ever saw movies like this. <laughs> Incidentally, I've always thought that the title of that film, Bread and Roses, applies to Elpidia. When she appears on screen, she invariably bestows her senses with roses. She's wonderful to look at, engaging, truthful, and dignified. But what makes Elpidia truly unique is that she also nurtures us with bread in such life-affirming films like Nine Lives and Salvador. The bread that makes it hard for her to accept roles, as she likes to put it, quote, that don't have anything to say. Along those lines, I'm very proud to share with you that only last week, Elpidia accepted to star in a film by one of our own talented students as part of SMC's Emerging Filmmaking Program. Thank you. I had the enormous privilege of directing Elpidia in The Other Conquest, where she plays Emperor Moctezuma's daughter, a princess who sacrifices herself in order to save her brother's life. In revisiting Elpidia's films this week, it struck me that the theme of sacrifice runs deep in many of her roles. And this is not a coincidence. In many ways, Latino women teach us on a daily basis that sacrifice is not a defeat, but a victory that sacrifice is ennobled by selflessness. Perhaps that is our other conquest as a culture, the art of giving. And in film, no one gives more than an actor or an actress. We're delighted to have here with us tonight an extraordinary Mexican actress, Elpidia Carrillo. In the films of Oliver Stone, history is not a pile of mute facts. It is not a distant set of recollections gathering dust. It is instead alive and immediate, a sledgehammer that smashes the wall of noise to provide a clearer vision. As stated at the end of JFK, past is prologue. Stone's cast of characters includes a journalist caught in the inferno of 1980s El Salvador an 18-year-old soldier experiencing the Vietnam War, a young Vietnamese woman surviving the destruction of her homeland, an attorney general determined to ask questions about the murder of John F. Kennedy, Dick Cheney plotting the takeover of the Middle East, and even Fidel Castro, the actual one, reminiscing about revolution and his favorite movie stars. In Oliver Stone's films, history connects through various threads, some directly, others like shadows chasing one another. Two shadows which haunt his work and our own times are the Vietnam War and U.S. involvement in Latin America. Like very few, if any, of our most relevant directors, Stone's eyes and ears are open to the history still being made in Latin America, or what Henry Kissinger notoriously termed, quote, our backyard. As a Mexican filmmaker who went through a seven-year struggle to bring an interpretation of the Spanish conquest to the screen, I can attest that Stone's efforts to bring Latin America into focus are no easy feat, and they are an inspiration and a guiding light to us all. In 1986, Stone's first two major works as a director dealt with different geopolitical conflicts that still harmonized in their exploration of the victims and participants of war. Salvador chronicled a journalist's harrowing experiences in war-torn Central America in the 1980s, while Platoon brought Stone's own time in Vietnam to the screen 
with a fierce evocation of memory. Both films challenged the prevailing trends in popular filmmaking, where movies like Top Gun and Rambo, or for that matter, Act of Valor and 300 nowadays, offer audiences Nietzschean supermen fighting evil foreigners in the name of blood and land cults. While Hollywood seemed determined to exorcise the ghost of Vietnam, Platoon and Salvador refused to let it go away, especially with Reagan's quest to conduct his own exorcism in Central America. Remember that this was the decade when Reagan justified funding the contrast because Nicaragua's own WMDs, the Sandinistas, might soon invade Texas, and that's a quote. <laughs> For the next decade, Vietnam and Latin America would have a lingering presence in Oliver Stone's films, bridging a drive to tell the truth about a conflict in faraway Southeast Asia with a profound interest in understanding events close to home, across our southern border. Both themes have literally connected to each other in his work. In what is possibly still his most discussed and debated film, 1991's JFK, Stone presents a thesis which asks serious questions about the possible link between emerging US policies towards Vietnam in the early 1960s, the obsession with overthrowing the Cuban Revolution, and the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Cuba, Vietnam, and US covert operations in Latin America also haunt the character of Richard Nixon, played by Anthony Hopkins, in Stone's epic 1995 drama Nixon, a film which in its exploration of power and certain imperial tendencies has proven to be timeless in this post-Bush Cheney era. Today, Stone has come full circle to Latin America and the importance of being aware of our history. It is crucial for US citizens, and by the way, I just became one a couple of months ago, yeah. <laughs> It is crucial for us to know about events like the Cuban Revolution, the civil wars in Central America, the conquest of Mexico, and so forth, because these events are themselves part of American history. They took place on the American continent, which we all inhabit. The civil wars of Central America might be over, but we are still seeing their aftermath in today's drug wars, and as thousands of Salvadorans, Guatemalans, and Hondurans trek across the border, joining their Mexican neighbors who continue fleeing the aftershocks of NAFTA. Remember the end of Salvador, when Elpidia Carrillo's character, Maria, is taken away by the border patrol. There's a good chance that at this moment, this situation is repeating itself somewhere as we speak. Recently, Stone has begun using the documentary medium to return to Latin America and challenge US ignorance about the region and shred popular misconceptions. Aside from the revealing Fidel Castro documentaries, in 2009, Stone focused on the political changes happening in Latin America with South of the Border. Made with the input of renowned author and activist Tariq Ali, the documentary functions as an informative, stereotype-busting road trip where Stone sits down with various leftist and progressive leaders, including Venezuela's Hugo Chavez, Bolivia's Evo Morales, Argentina's Cristina Kirchner, Ecuador's Rafael Correa, and Brazil's Lula da Silva. Stone asks questions, explores the region's countries, and shows viewers that important things are happening right here, right now, around the corner. The various leaders in the film discuss the hopes for overcoming Latin America's well-known ills of inequality, calling for respectful relations with the United States in which their independence must be honored. South of the border can be seen as a hopeful bookend to the landscapes of civil war and covert interventions in Salvador and JFK. Finally, it is not a myth that one of the great tests of a film's worth is how it survives the test of time. It can safely be said that Stone's work has already passed that test. As I often tell my students, take some time to scan international headlines when you go back home tonight. Read about what's happening in Latin America, the Middle East and Greece, you will immediately see why Stone's films never lose their sense of relevancy and urgency. Few directors have applied their resources, skills, and creative genius to caring so much about discussing the present through our immediate past, to striving to come to terms with society so close to us geographically, yet so far away in understanding. The films of Oliver Stone explore, <coughs> explore the complex stories of individuals who struggle with their identity, moral integrity, and souls. And in doing so, 
They help us get closer to the Socratic ideal of know thyself. Audiences worldwide will continue to benefit from the inexhaustible legacy of this unique filmmaker for decades to come. It is our honor at Santa Monica College to welcome to our campus Mr. Oliver Stone. incredible speech in which he says he does what he does because he believes in America, he believes that we stand for something, for our constitution, human rights, not just for a few people but everybody in the planet. I've been showing this film for many years in my class and every time that scene plays I get chills and frankly I wish I never stopped getting those chills because that would mean that I've become a cynic. And especially now it's meaningful for me because my wife and I are raising our kids in this country and I think that's the, ideal the idealism that we believed in when we came here. I think that scene is crucial for us to understand Richard Bull's character, but I'm also wondering if it was one of the motivations why you made this film. I think it's a very, very, very important what Bull says there. Can you please talk about that? You're, you're an idealist, Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, thank you for the introduction, by the way. It's very elegant. Um, that scene, is, it brings to mind, uh, I remember uh, writing that scene out of self-righteous passion and anger, because I had seen the situation down there. I'd gone down there with Richard Boyle, and I had been reawakened, reawakened. I said I was about 35, 36 years old, and Boyle took me on a trip to Central America where I saw a repeat of what I had seen in Vietnam uh, some uh, 14, uh, 13 years before. And I was shocked because I really had the attitude that Vietnam had put us in another place and that we'd moved on. And I thought that was behind us. And when I got there to uh, Central America, I saw American soldiers everywhere in uniform and not in uniform, a lot of covert operation. But in Honduras, especially, uh, the uniforms were pouring in because there was a lot of military presence building up for the, uh, and there was a, this move towards invading, uh, there was at that time this very strong move towards invading Nicaragua with American troops beside the Contras. So that was building in force. And uh, it was actually Oliver North and all that scandal that knocked the momentum knock the wind out of that movement. Anyway, I was, I, I reawakened a conscience that had been buried in America, in the Watergate and uh, Carter and all the hopes of Carter, you know. So I didn't see what I saw there. I saw Vietnam again, mm -hmm. redux. So uh, coming to write the screenplay, it was a very difficult process because it was not financeable. It was considered anti-American, you know. Latin American subject matter is always difficult for American, North Americans to absorb, so it was resisted everywhere. But that speech uh, was my uh, desire to say, I really felt like this would be my last film, I swear to God. I, mean, I, said, I will never work after this movie because if I don't say this, if I don't, I'm a dramatist, I've done screenplays, and I knew that you don't write speeches like that. You know, you're not right. supposed to, it's not good dramaturgy. You get plunked out of college, if you write in, you know, in the screenplay, the teacher puts an X through that and they say, don't do it. But I love Paddy Chayefsky, I love that kind of crusading madness of his. And I said, I'm going to do it because I'll never work again, I'm just going to, and the producer wanted me to cut it, there was a lot of issues. The film survived, a two and a half hour cut, it was brutal, uh, we had bad ratings, we had almost like an, at that time, I think it was an X or whatever it was called. Uh, you know, the poorest rating. We had to fight our way to get the film released. But I never cut that scene. Never. And wow. Jimmy Woods put his heart into it. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, still, I mean, there's, it's a bit of a straw man scene because the two Americans basically protested and erupt, but they never get to speak mm -hmm. in their version of events. But so what, you know? At least we got Woods to say what, what's important to believe. It's a principle. Yeah. It's hot in here, isn't it? It is a little bit hot, yes. Well, that wine you gave me at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and media, uh, you 
hadn't seen the film in a long time, I believe, and uh, I'm, I'm really curious, how did it strike you tonight? And, uh, and you know, it was 25 years ago, and uh, I, I, I've read in many places that, uh, that Oliver conceived this film as a two hour, 45 minute film. So one of the things I'm wondering is if you, you know, was the character of Maria diminished in any way? Did, did Maria suffer from that? Uh, the Maria you saw on the screen today, was it the same one that you, you know, you read about the first time you laid eyes on the screenplay? It has been many years ago. Yes. Many years ago. Time in the microphone. It has been many years ago, as you can see, of course, no? I mean, gosh, my goodness, like, I was... You, you look better than ever. Oh it's really, I was, I was, I cry when I cry. <laughs> I cry, you know, seeing myself there, it's so beautiful. Um, you know, honestly, at that age in my life, in those years in my life, I didn't know so much about what was going on in El Salvador. I didn't know as much as I can see now watching the movie. When I um, met Oliver, it was, for me, what I remember now is that I see this guy that comes in very passionate and talks to me about that he understands and he believes what Castro is about, what Che Guevara is about, and he understands that he has been in Nicaragua, he has been in El Salvador, he was been in, in those places. And I just see another, in my eyes, in those years, you know, at my age, I just see another Fidel Castro, I see another Che Guevara, I see somebody really powerful, and I see somebody that it doesn't represent quite completely, you know, what, who I am and what Latin people are, but the way he talked to me, I wanted to do the movie. I didn't speak much English then, and I think that I didn't understand what was written completely until I watched the movie. And I, um, I just trusted him, and I totally, absolutely, completely believed in him. And I think that from then on, watching his movies and everything that he has done, it totally made me understand that I would make the right choice, and I have been very lucky, actually, to be part of uh, uh, special movies like this and work with you know amazing people like like Oliver and seeing this movie again, there is a little there's there's some things that yeah I mean I didn't I, I think that in those years I did complain a little bit like oh why can she why can she talk why can she fight why can she do these things you know and he was like you hold the baby you have a baby you're a mother you hold the baby I hold the baby good okay. And, 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 he had this amazing, he his first, remember you had your first son, your first baby, and he was this amazing, most beautiful little boy, and so uh, Elizabeth, your wife, then he was like, she was like, she needs to practice, and she needs to know how to hold a baby and be a mother, and I was actually very um, angry at that, because I was like, I am a Latin woman, and I, and I took care of all my nephews, and all my nieces, and my younger brothers, and sisters, I know how to hold a baby, you know? <laughs> but I can see now that I was very young and I, you know, I, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't very experienced. Uh, but I can, I, I think that it's a very powerful character. I think even though it, she doesn't speak much, I think it really represents this, this pureness, you know, that, that like, it just like the 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 the, the, the la, la madre latina, la madre tierra, la madre patria. That's what it means to me when I see it, and um, and I'm happy and I'm very proud that I did that movie. And thank you. So well, there was a double story going on because Richard Boyle, the uh, who lived these experiences, had had his own Maria uh, just a few years, two years before, and he had had, of course, an affair with her, and she had children, and it got involved. It got messy with the authorities because her children. I forgot the exact story, but as it, as we said, she ended up. He ended up falling. He said he fell in love with her, of course, and he brought her television and all that. And he brought her back. But meanwhile, he had his eye on Elpidia, who was a 
actually a, a young Indian girl who didn't speak much English from Mishrakhan, as I remember. Mishrakhan? Yeah. And uh, he was, you know, he wanted to get in her pants the whole movie. And so she's like telling Jimmy, it was Richard, Richard, Richard. And there's Richard right behind saying, it's me, it's me, you know. He's like, and of course Woods hated Coyle. And it was, this, it was an endless, uh, endless fight going on. But you remember Richard had eyes for you. Oh, yes. <laughs> but you see, at that point, I, I, I thought that this guy was like, oh, no, because he would come to me behind Oliver, and he was like, you, no, 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 Ma Maria was a fighter, okay? You, you, you say this, and you say that. No, 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 she needs more. She needs another close-up. Like, I mean, I was very innocent, so I thought, like, okay, this guy wanted me to be a revolutionary. No? And they understand that it was a totally different thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know. I, I, I wanted to ask you about your, your standpoint concerning U.S. involvement in foreign affairs, Latin America specifically. I think many of us watched the film, and it, it's clear that we were betting on the wrong guys. Uh, the film makes you feel like perhaps we shouldn't be there in the first place. And then, of course, there's the counter-argument to that, that as a superpower, sometimes we need to be involved. You know, if uh, a country's burning, if uh, things are going down the drain, that we should do something. Uh, but that hasn't always been the experience. We get involved in foreign affairs, we make a mess out of it, because we're looking after our own economical interests or the excuse that we were being threatened, or because we, you know, the Wilsonian doctrine that we want to export our moral values, our democratic ideals, and so forth. What is your standpoint about this? What, what should we do? Do we get involved? Do we not get involved? We're working on a 10-hour answer to that with called the, uh, the uh, Untold History of the United States, which is coming out in uh, November from Showtime. So we've been working on it for four years. We traced American imperialism uh, back to 1900, you know, and uh, the Cuban War and the Spanish War, Philippines. It, it go, it, you, you see a, an attitude take shape, particularly after World War II, which is the war, of course, where, uh, the, you know, the fable, the mythology of the greatest generation comes from. But out of that experience, World War II is when America accelerates into, really, into a, an empire. And, of course, you know, this is one minor incident, the Salvador War, in, in a long string of interferences, not only in Latin America and Central America. I mean, you must have at least 50 of them there, at right. least 50 or 60, in, including much death. But, you know, you have to look at Asia, you have to look at the Middle East, you have to look at uh, uh, Europe, too. And not only Eastern Europe, but Western Europe as well. So there's constant, uh, it's, it's, an odd, it's so, deep, so deep and so pervasive and beyond the ken of the American public. It's a shame. It's the way of the world, and I think if you're very old, you know, you start, you see all the trickery, and, it, and every time they come up with another reason for an interference. Now, whether you call it human rights, or you call it uh, war on drugs, or because drugs are, of course, an issue that people can get moralistic about, or whether you call it terror, the war on terror, it's, these are simplifications that hook, that are narcotics, that hook the public constantly, and hook the media, above all, media and much of the public, not all. And we go into uh, these good causes, so to speak, like Wilson did, or bad causes, but it never, never turns out too good. Uh, I would say the record is 99 point failure, 99 percent failure, whether it's Afghanistan most recently or I don't see anything good from it. I, I have first-hand experience of it, of course, in, in Vietnam, which was a debacle, a real debacle. I mean, three million Vietnamese went down, maybe three and a half, maybe more, three and a half million Vietnamese. So we have never apologized for anything, except the Guatemala genocide. I think Clinton was the only one who ever said anything about it. And he was roundly criticized and ignored in this country for that. He said that at the UN. It's a horrible record. And I think when history will be written in the future, the Obama speech, Nobel speech, will be seen as a travesty, a travesty of what we are as a country. So, and so if you, you young people, you young people are in college. You know, you should study. Uh, some, a wonderful speech was made at the Nobel, which the one is the one that should have been, instead of the Obama one, was the one that Harold Pinter gave before he died. It's an amazing speech. I hope you have a look at it on YouTube if you have a chance. Harold Pinter was a British playwright who uh, made it, uh, who won the literary prize. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would you be more comfortable with the sort of? 
Jeffersonian model of isolationism and let's strengthen the nation rather than try to export yes. our yes, I would. You know, I, I would wonderful values. Well, I think we have to make our values at home and aggression yeah. begins at home. Yeah. Absolutely. You think we might be going there right now with you know, what's happening in Latin America, which you explored in South of the Border, it seems so significant and we're hardly aware of it. We have all these new leaders, progressive, liberal, open-minded, who are taking a stand saying, you know, enough is enough. Uh, we're going to be sovereign nations now. We're going to be independent. We have millions of Latinos in this country. Do you think that might start seeping into the U.S.? That's what uh, my co-author of the movie felt, uh, Tariq Ali, Tariq. felt that there's a Hispanic bridge to the New World and that many of the Hispanics in this country will make a difference, except that many of the Hispanics who come here tend to uh, sink into a comfort zone where they're trying to make a living and they, and then they start to, uh, when they start to rise in the ranks, they often abuse their lower, the lower ranks. You know? right. So it doesn't work that way. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, but what's going on in Latin America is sinister, it's sinister. Obama came into office and we thought there was going to be some changes. There's been no progressiveness in the, any of the policies. We're still Whether it's in Honduras, the, 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 the way he dealt with the, the Honduras situation, the way he's dealt with the war on drugs in Mexico, it's a continuation of the repression. And by the way, it's nefarious because it, it's aggressive. It's not non-interfering. You know, we talk about Colombia where we have seven bases, mm -hmm. but you know, we don't talk about a Latin American command which was established recently where they, we have a fleet that circles Latin America and pisses them off at no end. We have aircraft carriers off Brazil. We, we know the resource values of Venezuela, and we know there could be a war in Venezuela, the way we're acting. We've created a Venezuela into a, an enemy, quote, not on the order of Iran, but certainly in that list. So there's an ongoing, it's not a status quo. It's, we, we, we realized several years ago that the shift, the, the way it had moved, all these presidents that were democratically elected, including Chavez, they were all democratically elected, monitored elections, the whole works, and here they are, and they come into office because of our Stone Age economic policies that were passed in the 1980s with Reagan, you know, neoliberalism, what they called it, the Washington Consensus, the International Monetary Fund, all these horrible deals went down. And these countries basically got, the people in these countries got tired and voted them all those leaders out and put new people in who objected. And Nestor Kirshner, who's in the south of the border, is a great hero of mine, as is Hugo Chavez, because they really fought the, and Lula, and Morales, and, and uh, Correa, Correa, yeah, Correa, all of them fought, fought hard against this uh, enormous pressure, which you can read about in the Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You, the pressures are enormous, they're behind the scenes. It's money, money, money. Kirshner uh, bankrupted uh, and, and declared bankruptcy, basically, and did not pay back the debt, which is an interesting proposition. You should study it if you have a chance. Uh, so here we are. Now it's going on. I mean, America realized it got edged out. The corporations are still there, but the government is really working night and day to get rid of Chavez, and they may very well get rid of him in this election with the money. They put money in all these elections. They, they'd love to get rid of Christina Kirshner. They keep saying that Lula uh, was the good left, and they divide these people like the way they divide Iran from Saudi Arabia, they divide. So they say all these things, create the media, and people don't know what's going on down there. And I think uh, they both, you know, with Rousseff in uh, Brazil, a wonderful, intelligent woman, certainly they've scared her. This is an ongoing, everyday affair. Hillary Clinton is this Secretary of State who runs his empire, and these people, her State Department people, are working night and day to get rid of any progressives in these countries. Thank you. It's not a, a sit-back situation where no. somebody has to has to declare uh, his animosity to the United States. It's an ongoing secret war. And again, going back to that speech Paul gave, I, I think that uh, you know that's the the positive connotation of patriotism in this country that we have to ask these questions and we have to challenge what our government is doing and I love it that he says we you've got to think of the people first and uh, you know that's beyond all the bureaucracy and the decisions that affect millions of people you were just saying Salvador is a very tiny part of this whole puzzle but 75,000 people died as a result of the death squads and all that and you know a lot of the descendants are 
here in Los Angeles right now. We have students here whose families came from there. I mean, it's incredible what these microcosms can become. Before I open it up to the audience, I'm sure they're, you know, just waiting for me to do that. Elpide, I want to ask you about the ending of the film. I've always believed this is just one of the great movie endings ever. Just when we feel, okay, they crossed the border, sense of relief, they got out of that hell. And then what happens, it just leaves you speechless, breathless. Can you talk a little bit about how did you experience it tonight? You know, that, that ending. And, and also, you know, it also makes me think about the, the title of the movie, Salvador, Savior. Was Boyle really saving her? Did she ever ask to be saved? Is he just trying to redeem his own demons? What, what, what do you think about all this? Many people made that comment in Mexico, especially in Mexico. Uh, that why is always, every time I worked in a movie, it was always, it was this white guy that was coming to save me. You know? <laughs> and, well, you know, I mean, I didn't write the story. But in this case, I mean, I think it really, really works for both of us. For the American person and for the Latin woman, you know? It was just two people, I just see two people that were in love and that he understood totally, absolutely what was going on over there. Um, and that, uh, you know, they just wanted to be together. I didn't see that political side of like, okay, there's this white guy that has come to say, you know, Plus he this poor woman the end, from no? what's mean, all he, over. He developed the conscience and he, you know, there's this new awareness, but he kind of failed in terms of what he was trying to do, which is really interesting. I, it hits you very hard. It's not a, you know, heroic ending. It's very, very hard hitting. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, of course. Um, you know, like the whole thing when we go through the immigration thing and he says, honey, did you take the, uh, what was it, the turkey out of the oven or something like that. And I, I was like, you know, and the, the whole thing, oh, I love when we go to Disneyland and all that. It, the whole situation, it was like very, it was so weird to me. I felt like I was actually coming to this country in, in that way, you know, just in, 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 without papers, you know, being... Uh, just pushed out by the, or out of my country by a situation, by the revolution, by something terrible like that, you know. I, I mean, I, I, I think that I believed, I believed that, you know, I believed at the moment that this guy was going to save right. me, you know. And, um, yeah, it, it fails, no? But I mean, that's life, right? And I liked it that better than they ended up together. Yeah. Right, yeah. and then what I would mean, she be doing in San Francisco? That's reality, you right? know? Uh, Oliver, along those lines, the scene when you have the guerrilla rebels executing the National Guardsmen, I, I think it's a really uh, fascinating scene, really complex. It gives us, you know, in this, you know, a little bit like Battle of Algiers, it gives you that other perspective that war is terrible, it's atrocious, you can see terrible things on both sides. Uh, I, 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 I'm convinced that you're not equating that with the 70,000 people who were killed by the National Guardsmen, but yet it's a, it's a reality check. It's a reminder of the things that can happen on both sides of the conflict. It also made me think of a, a, a really interesting scene you have in Heaven and Earth, where you have the Viet Cong executing the villagers, and, and even stylistically it's kind of similar. They, they go and they shoot them behind the head, and then they come to the protagonist's mother and they don't kill her. So, you know, I feel there's a certain symmetry in those two scenes. How do you feel about them nowadays? Were they hard to make? It's a very contentious question. Yeah. Just quickly, though, I'd like to refer to the border thing. That it's a real ongoing situation. The United States, at that time, uh, was not give asylum to refugees from Salvador. It was a huge issue, and they were turning them back at the border and sending them back if they're arrested in New York or New Jersey or wherever. And they were sending them back to their, to very difficult fates. So these people, who were really trying to get out of their death squad situation, were, were and then uh, recently in the news, and doing the opposite with Nicaragua, were right? sent back by the U.S. So uh, it is, an, and that's why we did that scene. Maria, the real Maria, never came to this country, but Boyle, uh, we decided to go that way to show this horrible situation. And you know, I just, you know, you, you cannot, you cannot compare what the uh, Arena Party did, and the death squads did, and the unofficial death squads, whatever they were, did the army, call it the U.S. trained army. These guys, the officers, and many of the men were trained at uh, the School of the Americas in Panama, and in Georgia too. These guys were serious killers. These guys went to Vietnam. They studied the techniques we used, the CIA, in Vietnam. Jose Medrano was one of the first to start the death squads. He's mentioned in the movie. 
And I remember he, he was in Vietnam and he came and he, it was like, you know, before Condor, the famous Condor uh, group in Chile, there was this American involvement. They brought their officers over from Central America and they taught them in Vietnam how to kill, how to root out insurgents, insurgents, people who thought of the left, reformers, uh, labor union leaders, teachers, people who were dangerous to the system, who wanted to reform the system. They were trained to root them out and kill them. So this is a dirty story. And, uh, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Recently in the news, re just recently, the this, this Salvador is, is still going on. The gangs descended on El Salvador because there was no stable central government. The United States had completely destabilized the leftist movement with this kind of Michael Murphy character. He was a good, good-hearted ambassador. Yeah, the good-hearted liberal, but he fucks up the situation by, of course, in the end, supporting the, uh, the, the military in that situation, which is a true story. At Santa Ana, there was a key battle which Boyle feels could have turned the war. So anyway, the U.S. does always come down on the side of, of, the, uh, of the dictator or the military in every country. Liberation theology was happening all over Latin America, and these, these priests really made a huge difference in Latin America, and that's why we showed some of them in the movie, but they were the ones who were really speaking out against this cruelty, this barbarism, and they suffered greatly, and they were a target of all these death squads were the priests for, for, for leading the uh, fight for reform. And that's how it started. Romero was killed, uh, the, the nuns were killed. It was a bloodbath down there. If you didn't want to be a reformer in Salvador and anywhere in Central America in 1979, 1980. And often they were tortured. So to equate the two bothers me. And that's what people do. Of course, that's the argument. If you make a movie like this, oh yeah, well you don't show the horrors of what the communists do or what the left does. And there are always horrors, there are always horrors. But I find, in my experience, that it doesn't balance out, that the horrors don't equate. What the Viet Cong may have done, and they did bad things, is nothing compared to what this, the South Vietnamese government troops did, as well as the American troops and the CIA and the Special Beret, the Green Berets. There's no equation, I've, and I've studied this situation all around the world, it just doesn't work out. But they always use that argument if there's one errant activity or a few things happen on the bad on the left. So that's why I got suckered into putting that scene in <laughs> to try to get distribution because I didn't have distribution and I wasn't exactly, you know, I, I wasn't a known filmmaker. I had a screenplay credits, but they were, you know, it's very hard to get a movie out. So they said, why, why isn't it more balanced? That was a criticism we got in, the new, in, in a lot of the reviews. Right. Why didn't they make it more balanced? He's a Costa Gavras type, you know. Balance is always where they, they, they trip you. They try to trip you up. He doesn't show both sides. Go to south of the border. He doesn't show the bad side of uh, Chavez. Well, he, everyone has a bad side, but I didn't see it. And I, let, I don't think anyone knows the good side. So here I am trying to say, hey, at least listen to the man. And him, Castro, too. Put a camera in his face. He saw looking for Fidel. And he said to me, I'm stunned. Say what you were going to say about Castro. Yeah, that was great. Well, I, I find it stunning that people give these very uh, harsh opinions about the movie and you realize they haven't seen the movie. You were so tough on Castro, on the second movie especially, looking for Fidel. The atmosphere feels so tense. You ask him questions and he's just aware of the camera there. And I mean, you, you, you were sort of relentless with him. And then what you read on the paper is that, oh, he gave him a free ride and he's just, you know, uh, letting him get away with murder. Well, they didn't see the movie, obviously. So it's one thing that, you know, I think that's why colleges, universities are so important. We have our students captive for four hours, so we show them these films, we can talk about it, we can discuss them, it's great. I mean, I think that's the beauty of teaching, you know. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me open it up to the public now. Uh, Nakon, please. My question is related to Salvador. My favorite line was uh, when he said, in order to get to the truth, you have to get close. And to get, sometimes getting close, you might die. I guess, how do you get the truth without dying or like sacrificing your family? You know what I mean? Like, I want to start. figure that out too. Uh, <laughs> I think we all have that issue. You know, it, it depends. I mean, where you are, your proximity to danger, you have to have a head for danger. I mean, there are a lot of journalists who are killed every year, as you know, pursuing the story. It, you can only measure the detail. It's measurable in, in the extreme details. It's not. You have to know when to get to the car that goes to that appointment, or whether you're going to make it to the other side. But get close. Obviously, that's the only way to feel it, smell it, and uh, you know, 
you, you have to run the risk. That's why journalism could be, uh, investigative journalism could be a very valuable, it's a very valuable tool, but it's, it's very, un, it's, it's not money making, and it's, it's not easy to get your story out with the editor class and the owner class owning the media the way they do in this country. How do you get that? How do you get that? Uh, I think it's a passion uh, that you have in your DNA. Certain people have it, and certain people don't care. And also people act out in different ways, you know. I think uh, they're activists, they're labor agitators, there's people who want genuine reform. There's uh, Carol Hamilton who's here tonight, the dean, one of your deans from Santa Monica who I've known for many years, who's also worked passionately, passionately for change. People who don't, you know, she's not doing it for gain. She's doing it because she believes. And uh, there's people, certain people have it, you know. But certainly, I think the the question of aggression uh, is very important. And I think you raised your point right. You're absolutely correct. You must deal with the aggression inside yourself. I feel anger, very much anger against some of these regimes and people who run these regimes. I've met many of them, and it's a genuine anger. But then I, on, in, on my certain my. I'm also trying to balance that anger and say, you know, this is the way of the world. This is going to happen. It's happened from all through time, and it's still going on. It will happen when I'm long gone. And uh, we have to uh, we have to deal with that aggression, that anger in us, that hatred for these people, because they're they're not going to change necessarily from because you're angry with them. The only way is to communicate. But the interesting thing in Salvador, by the way, it's just there is, you know what's happening in Salvador right now. They had a leftist leader from the FMLN, that group that you saw, the rebel group, made it to power. Mauricio Funes. Funes, yeah. He's in power now. He's the president after 20 years. And guess who the biggest threat to him right now is and who may disrupt his term is, guess who? The Arena Party. The Arena Party, which took power at one point is back in the, in the chase. So it's still the FMLN against the arena and the uh, so-called democracy, uh, the drug-ridden. And of course, the big issue is, guess what? Drugs. So they're saying, well, we need the, the FMLN, uh, the, uh, sorry, the arena party is saying, we need enhanced security against the drug war. Same story as before the death squads, the security death squads. And the, uh, the FMLN is saying, no, we don't want a drug war, and we have to stop it. And we're going to, we're going to, we have to organize ourselves so that we're not a conduit for uh, this kind of, you know, this narco trafficking. They're not against. It. They're not, it's a complicated issue, but basically, it's the same old fucking fight. It's, you know, human rights, the, our rights to reform, and then versus the security of our country, of our blessed country. It's, it's here it is, uh, 2012. Now, if it breaks into more violence, I'm sure there's a lot of violence here. They just killed a bunch of Jesuits not long ago, right? Yeah. About 10 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, it goes on. I mean, you have to look at this thing with balance and humor to a certain degree and detachment. Uh, Mr. Stone, as uh, the son of somebody who survived the Civil War in El Salvador, uh, it's, it's, uh, someone like me sees just how important it is to get movies like this made. But um, culturally, where do you think we are culturally, for example, since when you made Natural Born Killers, which is such a great statement about, you know, where we were in 1994, you know, consuming so much junk food for the brain. You know, uh, do you think we've gotten worse? And uh, do you think, uh, how do you think filmmakers can try to um, really break through, you know, that kind of consumerist kind of, uh, you know, like, the, the whole reality TV culture we're living in now, and do you think, does that play a large part in why people don't know anything about Latin America? Is it because, uh, you know, we're just getting worse from, like, when you made Natural Born Killers? I don't know about worse. I, I'm not one of those older guys who says everything's getting worse. I think it's the same. <laughs> it's the same ignorance now as it was then. Same ignorance when I was a kid, you know, 1960s. It's just ignorance. You know, people are not motivated to know because they don't support the education of the public in this country. Television is given over to consumerism, as you know, and junk. So how can people know anything? It's, it's, it's the same situation that, well, why do we have Joe McCarthy? Why do we have uh, Rick Santorum and uh, all these Republicans calling for war in Iran? They're all crazy. It's the same stuff. America has been insane for, and getting, uh, and perhaps because of the progression of 
wars. When there was, what, seven, eight wars that have been unnecessary completely. I mean, most every war since uh, World War II has been unnecessary. Uh, so, it, I, you know, for me, it's how many wars can we fight before we bankrupt ourselves? Yeah, I suppose callousness will set in, coarseness will set in in our society. It already has. But has it gotten worse? Joe McCarthy was pretty coarse if you were around in those days. So, you know, ignorance is ignorance. Let's just pray that we can uh, let this gentleman said convert every one of them to uh, a little more kindness in their hearts. I, I could not conceive of two Anglo folks running around with liquor in their hands and bottles, almost like throughout oh, the come whole on. thing. That's not true. Now, we had a problem in Mexico. The Mexicans censored the movie. They were, they were on us every day. You cannot make uh, uh, litter in the streets. Well, I was in these towns in Salvador, and it was the dirtiest pig, sl pig slop everywhere. And it's okay. It's the way it was. It didn't bother me. But when we put the pig slop in the town in Mexico, the censor would go around the set and say, you got to get rid of that. That doesn't look good for Latin America. That's bullshit. <laughs> On that note... <laughs> Censorship was very tough in Mexico. We had censorship, major censorship problems at that time. With sex, too, they didn't want her naked anywhere. Okay. Well, uh, the gentleman in the back, he's got his. One more question then. Okay. Thank you very much for being the predator. One of my. When you start your career, the hardest thing is to get anybody to believe in you, yeah. to get trust. Yeah. I think you have to work at it. <laughs> money also, but money comes from trust. You have to build the trust, and you have to build your own worth, your sense of confidence, and your sense of love, your sense of self-worth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.